go out there and fight, you know, uh, for these seats. I don't know what you have to say about the comments that he made. I think they are very unfortunate uh, coming from uh, Cabinet Secretary, mm -hmm. particularly the guy in charge of uh, security, mm -hmm. because that has been one of the biggest barriers that women have faced, the violent nature of our politics. And for the, the Cabinet Secretary to reiterate that, it is almost as though it's a given that during the political process, we're going to have, you know, violent episodes. So he's telling them, look, uh, Pigana Pia. So what exactly is he saying? How are they supposed to fight back? You know, are they, is he telling them to get gangs? What, what, what is he saying? You know, because um, it's not just about the women candidates. It's about voters. It's about how the electoral process is. And I think that the cabinet secretary should actually read the constitution. Um, Article 81 is very clear that one of the principles that uh, the electoral process must adhere to is non-violent, peaceful elections so that people are able to go and sell their um, their policies, their agenda in a peaceful environment. Right. So when he, he's telling women, you know, um, I, I think uh, he also said, you know, you have now entered into a male territory. Yeah. You know, statements like that ought not to be coming from the Minister for Security. And to think that he was uh, speaking to women. Is it possible that maybe we are overthinking and over delving into what he had to say? Maybe he, he was just saying, you know, women, you have to also uh, fight tena tenaciously uh, for these seats. No, mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that government has a responsibility to do is to ensure mm -hmm. that we adhere to the constitution, right. that they put in place an enabling environment. So we can't have government saying that the environment is already hostile, it is hostile to women, it is male dominated, mm -hmm. yet they are the ones with the responsibility mm -hmm. in ensuring that it is not violent, mm -hmm. that women are able to actually go in and campaign freely without fear mm -hmm. for the security of their lives. And that peop other people, uh, citizens, are able to go and sit in and listen. You know, so if the uh, environment is hostile, they have a responsibility to arrest the people who make that environment that way. So we cannot have government officials reiterating the negative aspects of our electoral process mm -hmm. without actually saying how they are going to address it. Because he should have been telling the women yesterday that we know Violence has really been one of the hindrances to you having, you know, uh, smooth campaigns. Mm -hmm. But as government and as cabinet secretary in charge of interior, I want to assure you that we have put every mechanism in place to ensure that you will mm -hmm. have, uh, you know, the campaigns will be smooth, they will be non-violent. Anybody who will be found engaging in violence will be arrested. All we right. will deal with it. That's what he should have been All telling right. them. Not telling them wajipange. Mm. So, how, do you, how do you tell people wajipange? And you are the one in charge. If the government is telling us to jipange, that is like saying you're on your own. Okay. You know, that, those, are, those are unfortunate statements. And he is the one who needs to overthink. Mm. He should have thought through what it is that he's coming to tell the women. They should have sat together with his counterpart in the Department of Gender mm. to actually say, look, this is the, these are the problems. I would, I would have expected at least uh, the, the, the cabinet secretary uh, for gender uh, to, de to actually brief him that, you know, these are the problems. We need to put A, B, C, D in place. Even when he gives blanket statements like, we will give you security. security. How many women candidates are there? Mm -hmm. How many women candidates are there? Because remember that we have already seen some very violent episode, episodes during the nomination mm -hmm. process. And to their credit, the government really did have security agencies available to nip anything in the bud. Mm -hmm. Although some, uh, some incidences Escalated. really got out yeah, of hand, yeah. but by and large, they really did manage to, to uh, you know, uh, calm the situation and, and provide the necessary security. Mm -hmm. But let's not forget that this was happening at a time when individual parties, it was intra-party uh, 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 nominations. nominations. Now you're going to have several candidates competing against each other. We have quite a few women. I know we have over yes. a thousand Many, women yeah. candidates, yeah. you know, from MCAs, gubernatorial candidates and all. So when they begin to say that they are going to attach security to women candidates, how 
uh, how reasonable is that? You know, is that is is that the best way to go? When you talk about is that uh -huh. practical? When when it, when it comes to providing what you're saying, what do you think would be the best way to go about it? The best way to go about it was for would be for them to ensure that the environment, the, the whole that environment. Their, the entire environment yeah. is peaceful enough mm -hmm. for me to go out and carry my uh, carry out my campaigns without necessarily needing security. security. You know, because. If they are going to attach security to every female candidate, don't forget we have male candidates out there who are also campaigning, who will also be demanding security. At the same time, we also have supporters. Because, you know, the violence is not perpetrated candidate. Okay, some candidates do perpetrate violence against each other. But we find that also, you know, supporters um, also do, yes. uh, you know, um, create violent episodes, you know. So the best thing to do would be to ensure that the environment, the environment as a whole is safe and that they know where the women are campaigning at any given time so that there is security there. To say that we are going to attach security to you so that in the event of a violent episode you're yeah. spirited away, you know, that's not practical. And especially at a time like this when we've already seen um, there, there are several other security uh, uh, incidences that must also be attended to. How practical is it for him to make such a commitment to women and when you are attaching security agents to candidates, you're also taking them out of, you know, the, 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 whole the, the whole arrangement. So what does that mean for everything else? Because it's not just about securing the candidate. It's also about ensuring that voters feel that they are secure to engage with the process. Interesting. And uh, Daisy, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, there is a report that came out from Elections Observers Group and they say that women uh, have been the most that have been caught up in the violent uh, rallies. Mm -hmm. we, uh, recently we had a woman die. Yes, in Bungoma. In Bungoma, in Bungo as a Bungoma. result yes. of, of this, uh, of this uh, incident. So. It's interesting that you're saying that it's, it's about creating a, a wholesome, safe environment for everybody who Absolutely. is participating. Absolutely. All right. So let's also talk about um, the environment. And you mentioned that, you know, right now we have quite a number of women going for, for politics. What does it say about the political environment now? Is it improving or is it just women coming out and saying, okay, fine, things may not be as perfect, but we'll still go out there and run for these seats? Well, the situation is definitely not perfect, uh, but I, I think that um, the, the, the activism around women and leadership mm -hmm. is making some headway because the women are also coming out, okay. um, but not so much coming out, but actually getting into getting seats with the mainstream parties because that's really been the challenge because, you know, it's the mainstream parties that usually garner the most votes. So it's, it's encouraging to see um, at the higher levels um, of governance that uh, women have managed to clinch, uh, you know, uh, dominant party mm -hmm. seats. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, it's still, we still have a very long way to go. Mm -hmm. And of course, political parties have a role to play. They are the primary gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. So because the political parties themselves are not fostering the inclusion of women, mm -hmm. and nobody is also checking on them, because remember that uh, political parties are funded by taxpayers, particularly those that Ghana over 5% of the vote. Mm -hmm. They then qualify to be funded. Yes. Uh, they get a measure of monies. Now, 30% of the funds that go to political parties is actually meant to be used towards activities to encourage more women, youth, and persons with disability to get involved in the political process. This is not happening. Nobody is monitoring how political parties are then fostering mm -hmm. women's engagement with the political mm -hmm. process. So the political parties have 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 remained you know the 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 you know uh, male dominated and women still have an uphill task we've seen um or rather we've heard uh from female candidates mm -hmm. you know you go through the nomination exercise yeah. you win and then you hear your your certificate has been given to somebody else yeah. there's a there's an incident of one woman who won her seat as an mca she's a sitting mca as we speak but she won the nomination uh -huh. her her nomination certificate was taken by one of the candidates in mm. the area and he called her and told her you know um i have your certificate if you want it you give me money and and i was like why did the party 
give out, give the, out certificate. the certificate. So there's still yeah. a lot of uh, mess within political parties, which makes it that much more difficult for women to participate. But also, these same political parties, they are the ones who come out. I mean, we've had quite a number of press conferences from political parties, and it's, it, it affects, I think, all of them. Coming out and saying that, you know, as a party, we're supporting women this time around. We're putting them uh, at the forefront. So, is it, so it, it, it's, it could just be talk, but not really, you know, practicality when it comes to actually giving women these opportunities. It is complete to, to talk. Look good. Mm -hmm. It is complete talk. Uh, the law requires that uh, for a political party to be registered, they must have at least uh, uh, two not more than two-thirds of the members of their national executive council um, of the opposite gender. And they have met that criteria. But beyond that, when we do see these women there, mm -hmm. we still see that they don't have power. They're not able to negotiate their yes. space within the political mm -hmm. parties. But they are trying. Um, but, you know, I think uh, one of the biggest problems that we have is that people don't know how to hold their parties to account. Mm -hmm. Because even as we, we engage with the women, we're always telling them politics is about interests. So how is the party taking your interests on board? You know, when we look at these major coalitions, when we look at the campaigns, you know, as they, they are being run, mm -hmm. um, we see more men, you know, when you look at Jubilee campaigns, it is the men in the forefront. Maybe when they are doing the women rep, you yeah. know, when, they are ca when, when it's a campaign for the women rep, you will see the women. But you hardly see, uh, you hardly see them in the making of the statements and everything if it's not uh, the party leader or their presidential nominee mm -hmm. and their, their deputy the president. You will find it is the secretary general who is speaking. Even when uh, Jubilee had... Um, a female secretary general. She's not the one who used to speak on behalf of the party. We, we've seen um, with NASA, I mean, NASA, we don't even see. I think Charity Ngilu has only just the, the joined the line now. Yeah. But uh, when statements are being made, usually it is the men who are making them. It is the men who... But we who, have Agnes uh, Zani, who's... Uh, she is the secretary general, but, you but you've also seen how that has gone, you know, in terms of uh, being able to make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like uh, they're... They are, just there for uh, show. So I, the question that we ask is, how much power do they wield? D when a woman sits in as Secretary General, mm -hmm. is she as powerful? Does she have the same powers that a man that sitting a man in the same position hold. has? Because, you know, look at uh, Rafael Tuju as Secretary General. He is he's the one who articulates the party position. Mm. Remember when Veronica Minor was the Secretary, Secretary General, General and he, I think, was the... Um, I don't know what if, if he was the pa he, party deputy he had, party leader. He had not joined that time, Rafael Tuju. But he was the one who was articulating yes, yes. the party position yeah. still, despite her being. So, so you see, when we, when we look at that, it it also tells you the the decision making within the party, the organs, how they go about it. So, I, I think that. Um, in terms of even being able to negotiate, because we've had senior women mm -hmm. in, uh, in parliament uh, from these political parties, and yet none of them have been able to push their parties to ensure that at least, uh, you know, the, the, the two thirds, even if in the absence of legislation, yes. that the party puts in place mechanisms to ensure that at, at least a third yeah. of, of, of the women get in. We have women leagues in these parties, and we keep asking them, why are you not pushing your parties? Because women are great mobilizers. You heard also Nkaiseri yesterday uh, saying that he owes his political career to his wife. Yeah. You know, she's the one who was bringing in the votes. And that is by and large very true. A lot of the women are the party mobilizers. They are the mobilizing machinery Behind the for, for, for the political parties. So mm. it's unfortunate that they've not been able to translate that into a capital that can help them negotiate with their parties for space. Because if you look at the heavy handedness of uh, the way the application of the law, it is the women who have been hit hardest. Mm -hmm. Margaret Wanjiro was incarcerated. I mean, she was locked up for a few yeah. days for uh, doing stuff that you know we saw several other people doing but got away with it. And we're not saying that women should get away with it, but we are saying we don't want to see selective it application of the law. application of the law. All right, Daisy, we'll continue the conversation. But before then, I want us to also talk about something that IBC is doing. And uh, Bungoma Governor Ken Lusaka and a member of parliament are among 14 candidates who will appear before the Independent Intellectual and Boundaries Commission Code of Conduct Reinforcement Committee. 
in the ongoing cases of alleged breach of law in the campaigns. Now, the 14 candidates are required to respond to allegations facing them. Lusaka, on his part, is required to appear alongside his competitor weekly for Mangati over the violence that shocked the area, leaving one person dead. Mm. Others summoned Arkibwezi East MP Jessica Mbalu and her competitor Philip Kaloki. The IBC chair, Bafula Chebukati, has cautioned uh, the more than 14,000 candidates to observe the set code of conduct saying they will not hesitate to take appropriate action against those who have been found culpable. So that is uh, IBC. They've summoned quite a number of leaders uh, to appear before their code of conduct enforcement committee in those ongoing cases in regards to just how they have been handling themselves over this whole period. And Daisy, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this one. Fine, it's okay to summon these people. We've seen so many people get summoned in this, in this country, but it never goes anywhere. Fine, they summon them they go answer a few questions and after a few a few days you know the, the story has gone down the carpet so are we likely to see anything solid with all these people who've been um, uh, summoned by IBC well I'm waiting to see like you uh -huh. because that has also been our complaint yeah. in fact the reason why we have such violent elections is because people know that there are no penalties. Mm -hmm. There is no penalty for breaching the electoral code of conduct. It is breached all the time. People do it in the open. Look, there's an electoral code of conduct. Part of the electoral code of conduct requires that mm -hmm. if a political party, mm -hmm. either the candidates or its supporters, mm -hmm. behave in a manner that breaches the electoral code of conduct, the IBC can bar the candidate from participating in the elections mm -hmm. and the party the penalty to the party is you're not allowed to replace them so then okay. the political parties become they, they are the frontliners mm -hmm. in ensuring peace ensuring that their 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 supporters do not engage in a manner uh, that will breach the electoral code of conduct mm -hmm. or breach the peace mm -hmm. but we don't see this we have seen many areas where people say this is a so and so zone you know yes and you try to go and campaign in that area and you are heckled. Mm. That, by the way, is against the electoral code of conduct. If you don't like what somebody is saying, walk away. Mm -hmm. You don't need to heckle, you don't need to boo and, and you know, um, threaten But haven't the, we them. become accustomed to that? Well, Uhuru that's... has felt it, Raila has felt it. Yeah, but Seems it shouldn't like be happening. Right. But it happens because there is no penalty. People do it because they know that Nothing the will. IBC is toothless. The other thing is, remember what the legislators did. Mm -hmm. They removed the power powers of IBC to be able to prosecute or execute these uh, penalties yeah. and they have moved it to the DPP, right? So when IBC is calling these guys, perhaps the most they can do is, uh, you know, slap them with a fine. Now, if you're slapped with a fine of 50,000, mm -hmm. because I think those were some of the fines that people were being slapped with, you know, you've, you've created violence, you've, your, your supporters have beaten up your opponent, you are called you are slapped with a fine of 50,000. Yeah. That's peanuts. For these guys who are running campaigns in the millions of shillings, 50,000 is very little really money. Nothing, yeah. When we begin to see harsh penalties meted out against electoral offenses, we are going to then see candidates paying attention. Please remember the elections of 2013. Mm -hmm. People uh, look to these elections and say that they were peaceful. But why were they peaceful? Remember that the scepter of I ICC was hanging over the country. But because of that threat, our politicians were very keen on how they carried out their yes. campaigns because they did not want to be seen as inciting anybody, anybody. to violence. Yeah. The media were also very keen mm. on how they reported stories. So it is a collective exercise. Now, when people know that there is no there's you know, uh, penalty, penalty, and we have this attitude in Kenya of umtadu, mm. you know, because this violence, it's not just uh, the violent episodes like what uh, Governor Lusaka is being called for, because it is in Bungoma where the woman died. The woman died. She was in the market. Mm. She was in the market. She wasn't even part of yes, the campaign. Yes. She was in the market. But because of the violence of these uh, two opposing sides, uh, life was lost. Really, to show the value of human life, harsh penalties must be meted out because that woman will have died in vain if nobody goes punished yes. for this. But aside from that, there's a lot of verbal violence, mm -hmm. particularly against women.
where women, um, I think there was an episode where Joyce Laboso was campaigning and they began to demand of her that they wanted to know where her husband was. Really? By the way, those are part of electoral offenses because my role is to come and sell my policies, yes. my ideology, my manifesto. It's not about mudslinging mm. you. You know, where's Betty's husband? And, you know, she was married, she's barren, she's, you know, mm. she's not married. You know, those kind of things, discrediting you at a personal level. Yeah. The IBC is not reining that in. How is the media covering them? Mm. You saw the other day, headlines. Cat fight in Kirinyaga. Mm. What, cat fight, really? These are women leaders. Why is it when women are engaging, suddenly it's a cat fight? I mean, really, what, how, how are you profiling them? You know, so it's showing that women can't uh, conduct themselves in a civil manner, right. you know? Um, how is the media covering the women? How, how do they profile women when they bring out, you know, these negativities, the negative mm. stories? Mm. Same thing when uh, these leaders use the platform to insult one another, you know? Nobody's reining them in. We've seen it, and it, but, it's, it's, it's across the board. But also, uh, Daisy, as we, as we wrap up, it's not about um, IBC too. Look at all those uh, hate speech cases that we've had over the last couple of months, and then nobody has been convicted. Yesterday I was speaking to one of the commissioners, and they said, you know, we present the names, but when they get to the uh, office where, where this uh, should be investigated, nothing, is ha nothing happens. They go scot-free, like what we've seen over the last couple of months uh, happening to other politicians. So is it like a general, uh, you know, way that we handle things in the country, nobody is held to account. They are sacred cows. Mm -hmm. So if I touch this one because they are allied to so and so, mm. I will be bringing down this. But also, don't forget that our leaders also bully these institutions, mm. right? You remember when uh, Senator Watangula was, um, his, his uh, uh, election was nullified. Yeah. Uh, there was, you know, the, the, the mobilization with the aim of intimidating, intimidating the courts, intimidating uh, the, the institution. Th that's the same thing that we would see happening, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, a prominent leader, who, by the way, is probably guilty, guilty. as charged, yeah. the followers will come and say, if you dare, there will be trouble. Yeah. You've already seen it. Yeah. You've already it's seen true. it. If you, you, you know, arrest at your own peril, dare you, we shall do this. You know, where one side is using the powers that they have available to them to intimidate, the other side is using their numbers to issue threats. So that doesn't go well for okay. the country, you okay. know, in terms of um, a more peaceful environment. And right. it is, it, 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 it should worry us. It should worry us. Thank you very much, Daisy Amdani, for your insights. Very interesting conversation. She is a coordinator of the National Women's Steering Committee, speaking to us about uh, some of these issues and especially what the CS for Interior, Joseph Nkaisei, had to say yesterday about women. Um, very interesting views uh, here in studio. Thank you very much for staying with us. We'll take a break right now. And when we come back, we'll be beginning our second hour of the show. Don't go away. We still have quite a number of other conversations coming up shortly. Don't go away. We'll be right back.